Good evening, I'm Mike Fortune and I will be your host for this our weekly virtual town hall meeting concerning the COVID-19 emergency here in the city of Hamilton. Of course, we welcome everyone watching and listening on cable 14, 900 CHML radio and on the city of Hamilton's YouTube channel. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, and uh, the viewers who I should say are watching on your TV in Burlington, as well as those listening to these weekly town hall events on their telephones. And of course, tonight, we will update you with the latest information about the COVID-19 emergency here in Hamilton, and we will answer as many of your questions as possible. Of course, joining us this evening uh, are Mayor Fred Eisenberger, Mr. Paul Johnson, Director, City of Hamilton's Emergency Operations Center, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, City of Hamilton's Medical Officer of Health, and again, we have another special guest this evening, Grace Mater, Director of Children's Services and Neighborhood Development for the City of Hamilton. And of course, as always, we welcome your participation in tonight's town hall meeting, and you can submit questions in one of two ways directed right to our guests. You can, of course, go to the city's website at www.hamilton.ca slash uh, ask COVID questions, or you can reach us on Twitter by tagging at City of Hamilton in your tweet. And of course, once again, this evening, our staff are monitoring social media and the City of Hamilton website, and we will get to as many of your questions as time allows. And of course, we get hundreds of questions each week, and we do our very best to answer as many as possible. And we thank you for submitting questions and hope we will be able to keep you in the loop with what is going on throughout the next few weeks as we continue our virtual town hall presentations. With that said, Mr. Mayor, as we usually do, perhaps you can begin by giving us a brief update on how things are going in Hamilton as of right now and how it relates to COVID-19. I believe we have the mayor on mute here. Uh, Sorry about that, Mr. Mayor. We had am, you on mute. I, am you, I you're on, on now? mute. You you are All on right. now, Mr. Mayor. We can hear I, you. Sorry about I that. Certainly like to be heard. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Michael. I appreciate that, and and thank you to Cable 14 and CHML and everyone watching who's uh, dialed in today. And thank you for your questions. Hopefully, we can give you some answers that uh, will help inform. Uh, you know, this may be getting a little tired, but uh, I'm still very pleased with the response in our community. Uh, as we opened up our waterfront trails this past weekend, the parking lots and adjacent parks and rail trails, uh, the, uh, it, it, my sense of it is that everyone uh, maintained that physical uh, distancing and uh, we're abiding by uh, what they're being asked to do relative to the virus that's still in our community and still needs to be, uh, we still need to be mindful that uh, the spread can continue even though, you know, we're seemingly doing better than many other communities in, uh, in greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Uh, that virus is still out there and we're certainly not clear of that and that's something that's going to continue. Uh, I, along with the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area mayors, called on the province to uh, step up and uh, start the discussions with our federal partners on, on assistance and aid for municipalities in, in Ontario. Clearly there are going to be significant financial challenges for municipalities. Toronto being the largest, as you might expect, uh, you know, one, one and a half billion dollars potentially in lost revenues and, and added expenses relative to the uh, COVID uh, event. And certainly those kind of numbers and numbers in Hamilton, upwards of 25, 30 or 40 million dollars and other municipalities in similar boats. These numbers are uh, staggering and uh, I think we're going to need assistance to help cities continue to deliver the uh, services and the recovery that we all want to uh, get to uh, sooner rather than later subject to you know the virus uh, you know abating in our community and i know the doctor will talk a little bit about uh, how we're doing there and how we're making out with that uh, that effort but for all intents and purposes uh doing pretty well uh, but we need to continue on with the work that that we're doing in terms of physical separ separation so mike i think uh, the city of Hamilton is doing well there's a number of things we can talk about later about uh, council and the, the recommendations that were made today, but uh, I'll start there and I'll leave it to you to ask some any additional questions that are coming in from viewers. Well, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. And uh, we do appreciate, we know it's actually been a long day for you. So uh, if you can hold in for us for one more hour, that'd be great. We're gonna head on over to Dr. Richardson now and doctor, as we typically do to start out this program, we would also like uh, an update from you on the status of COVID-19 and how it relates here to Hamilton. 
And I think we have the doctor on mute Getting as well. problems we... too tonight, right? <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, Mike. Today we're at exactly 500 cases and um, 495 of those are lab confirmed, five are probable. There are, as always, a lot more details that you can find on our website about the status of cases, demographic information, risk factors, all of those things. Of the 500 cases, we're at now 366 or 73% of the cases have recovered. And so that's, again, very encouraging as we go forward in terms of us flattening the curve and showing that the number of people that are resolving is very much catching up with the number of cases that we have had. Unfortunately, we do indeed have one new death um, again today. That's 25 deaths in total. This was an 81-year-old woman from the community who did pass away on May 11th. And so our thoughts go out very much to her friends, her family, um, for the difficult time that they are having right now. And again, highlighting just how um, COVID is especially a problem for those who are older, those who have chronic medical conditions in our community. We currently have 11 institutional outbreaks that are going on, none within any community sites. And of course, there's many more details on that. And I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to all the nurses, all my colleagues um, in Hamilton Public Health who are working on case and contact tracing, as well as providing essential services. And also to all of the nurses in Hamilton that are serving our community, whether they're in hospitals, long-term care homes, um, working in home and community care and so many places across the community serving courageously right now through COVID in sometimes very, very difficult circumstances as, uh, as we work to keep Hamilton well. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, by all means, here, here to that, our, our frontline workers are doing an extraordinary job. We're going to head over now to Mr. Paul Johnson. Paul, great to see you again. And as we also like to do with you, fine, sir, can you please give us an update on the city's operations and the work of the EOC since we met uh, last week? Sure, thanks very much. Uh, you know, what much of our work right now is preparing for things like the announcement that's gonna to happen tomorrow uh, by the Premier, where he outlines just a little bit more about what stage one uh, reopening in the province looks like and preparing ourselves for uh, the eventual restarting of more and more activities in our community. We saw some of this uh, this past week with uh, certain retail businesses being able to, to open. And uh, we also, as the city, uh, started to encourage more uh, use, as the mayor said, of our of our parks and some of our trailways, and in consultation with our uh, colleagues at the Hamilton Conservation Area, uh, starting today, uh, in addition to their rail trails, uh, some of their conservation areas uh, will be open for passive use. So again, it's the walking, it's the cycling, it's getting out to uh, ensure that we get some fresh air and we have opportunities to be a little less cooped up in our own homes. And so that encouragement is still there. It's to do it safely. And uh, there are, you know, not a huge amount of rules about how to do this safely. Uh, but the key ones, of course, are to keep our distance from one another. Uh, the second, of course, is that, uh, you know, gather together with members of your own family that you live with, fine. And even if you want to put out the blanket and, uh, you know, have a little picnic as a, as a small family unit uh, that live together, no problem. Uh, it's not the time for gatherings. Uh, this isn't a chance to get together with friends and, and have barbecues yet. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, so obviously staying within your own family group and uh, then the other pieces are good hand hygiene. Uh, try not to touch your face uh, very much. Constant washing of the hands, those types of things. So the good news is, is that, uh, you know, there's more opportunities now as the weather starts to get a little warmer and a little better that uh, people can get out and enjoy some of the good green spaces and open spaces in the community. And we really want to encourage people to do that. Uh, one of the changes that uh, will happen as we go through the week as a result of retail starting to open a little bit and provide some curbs curbside uh, services if they so choose to is we are going to uh, revert back as of Saturday uh, to uh, having uh, fees be collected in some of our parking areas, uh, parking meters and in our municipal parking lots. Uh, we did suspend that early on in this crisis because we needed to keep those parking spaces available. Uh, a lot of people were coming into certain areas of the city and uh, even our public health folks, for instance, uh, lots of people coming into some of the places downtown and we really wanted to keep that parking for free. And quite frankly, there weren't people out because nothing Thing was open. Uh, that's changing. We need to keep uh, those parking spaces now. They're available for employees and obviously those who are coming down to uh, pick up some items from these retail folks. So starting Saturday, uh, they will now uh, be, you need to pay for parking in terms of meters and municipal lots. 
There is, however, a 30 minute grace period as a way of supporting uh, our merchants. Uh, they, they, we won't be uh, obviously finding people. If you can stay within that 30 minutes and do what you need to do, then you're free to park and, and the parking is free. But if you are going to be staying in that spot uh, for longer than that 30 minutes, then uh, uh, you will be uh, ticketed if you don't uh, pay for the parking as you used to. I know we get questions about permits. And so the, the, it remains that through the month of May, if you have March or April permits for some of our lots, uh, they will still be honored, but starting on June 1st, you will have to renew that. So uh, those old uh, uh, parking permits uh, will not be valid uh, for the month of June. So again, uh, we took the action of not charging for parking as a result of, of needing to do some things and open up some spaces downtown in particular, but around the community. I will remind folks though that we still have completely relaxed some of the residential time limits. So if you are living in an area with a one hour parking limit or a three hour parking limit, uh, as well as the 12 hour limits uh, on our streets, those are all still suspended. Uh, and that's a way of encouraging people, obviously if they're sick, that they can isolate and stay home, but also for many people who are working from home right now. So a few of the things that uh, are going on, and in particular, our work continues to be uh, our reopening strategy for the City of Hamilton Services uh, and aligning that with the public health information and the province's information. And we expect uh, more to flow from that in the next uh, two weeks. Wonderful stuff. Thank you very much for that update, Paul. We uh, will continue on now. Mr. Mayor, earlier today, uh, and I know we, you just got out of it, City Council held another virtual council meeting. Would you mind giving us an update on the meeting and highlight any important decisions council made as it relates to COVID-19, please? Thank you, Mike. And yeah, it was a good productive meeting. Uh, as you know, I, I put forward a, a direction to ask staff to put a terms of reference together for an economic recovery task force. Uh, that, that terms of reference was approved today. And so the whole idea around this is to have a collaborative approach with uh, representatives from local businesses, labor, industry, and the academia, uh, various sectors in our community that are important parts of our business, sports and entertainment, film, music, uh, retail, of course, uh, all sectors that uh, need to get back up and running. And uh, once, once we get the go ahead uh, and the virus is uh, somewhat in check, that uh, we are able to help them kind of reestablish themselves in, in terms of uh, providing employment and opportunity in our community. So it's all about future employment, all about getting those businesses up and running. And uh, hopefully we can uh, help them, uh, assist them to uh, making that as smooth and as quick as possible to help uh, the future employees and businesses going forward. So council also approved to allow restaurants under certain circumstances to expand into patios and potentially roads and parking lots. And uh, the rationale clearly is that uh, restaurants when and if they're allowed to open more fully uh, are gonna require additional space if they're to maintain that physical separation. And certainly physical separation is gonna be, be with us uh, whether we like it or not for quite some time. The whole room went dark when I said that, I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, but the reality is it's gonna be, I think a positive step to, uh, to allow some restaurants. And you know, there has to be a kind of an understanding on the street. Uh, there has to be some consensus around, uh, you know, opening up those spaces. It doesn't, uh, it shouldn't impact uh, other businesses that may not be restaurants and retail or need loading spaces. So there's a lot of complexity to this, but the reality is that we have a special events advisory team that can work through these issues as well as our staff and uh, afford uh, restaurants an opportunity to, uh, to expand their space to, uh, to make them more viable. So I think that was a particularly positive step and we'll see how that plays out once we uh, get the go ahead. Council also made a very sad uh, you know, announcement today that uh, by, by virtue of the fact that uh, it's gonna cost many, many millions of dollars to maintain and operate the wild waterworks. And uh, the, re the reality is that uh, through physical separation, it's gonna be very, very difficult, if not impossible to do. And so rather than uh, attempt to do that and expend all of these dollars without uh, you know, a confirmed revenue source, it was decided today uh, by uh, a recommendation from the Hamilton Conservation Authority to shut down the wild waterworks for the remainder of uh, this year. So it will not be open this summer. And uh, they are gonna do some maintenance work uh, while it's uh, closed and probably a good opportunity to do some of the work that they otherwise might not be able to do throughout the season. They're gonna get done you know, rather properly over this, uh, this uh, summer season. And so hopefully be back in business in a better state of repair next year when it comes back for a fuller operation. So 
no one would want this to happen, but I think the realistically to try and bring that many people into that space uh, probably isn't going to be even going to be allowed by the province. And, uh, it, and if it were, it would be exceedingly difficult to try and maintain that physical separation. So I think uh, it was probably a, an unfortunate wise choice to make and we'll work towards uh, ensuring that uh, that facility is available to uh, citizens uh, come next year. So those are some of the things that we dealt with at council today, Mike. Thank you very much for that update, Mr. Mayor. And no doubt a difficult decision with Wild Waterworks and there may be some more difficult ones as uh, you find folks continue to do what you do. Um, thank you for that. Uh, joining us now is Grace Mater. Uh, she is the city's director of children's services and neighborhood development. And she's joining us as a guest this evening. Grace, thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. We do appreciate it. Perhaps you could start by talking about some of the measures the city has put in place to date to help our vulnerable and homeless population. Great, yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks very much for uh, the invitation. So um, what we're doing, um, I've been assigned the role of being the operations chief um, for our emergency operations center, working alongside with Paul. And uh, really early on, it was an all hands on deck kind of approach to this. So we um, had many staff amongst the city staff redeployed to areas. The first thing that we did was uh, to look to the partnerships with, uh, with many of our community agencies on how we were gonna do this together. So with the help of uh, Joanne Santucci and Food Share, we quickly galvanized um, her resources and her buying power in order to leverage the dollars that we needed in order to get the food that we knew that was going to be in great demand. So with Joanne, um, we've been able to do custom hampers out to folks throughout the community. Um, we've got drivers with city staff that help with delivering of those. Um, so that was just one really quick example we knew right off the bat. The other was looking to um, the sector um, for the shelter sector for both men's, women's, families, and the need to ensure that we had the right resources and the right supports there in order to meet the demand. So we are very fortunate with the, the partnerships that we've got with the community, um, with Good Shepherd, Salvation Army, um, the YWCA. Um, those are just a few of the examples. So early on, we galvanized some work around creating an isolation center, just in case um, to be prepared that if there was anyone that tested positive within the shelter, that we had some place for them to go. We were able to set that up really quickly um, with some support from Red Cross and public health at uh, the Benetto Community Center. Um, to this point, we've been very fortunate. We've only had um, two um, people that have had to stay within the, the, sh the center. And as of the moment right now, well, there's no one there. Um, we also look to, um, with the guidance of public health, to look to how can we securely and safely have our shelter systems working um, that allowed for social distancing, that allowed for the kind of um, precautions that were needed in order to keep people healthy within the system. We reached out and we then opened up the center at the First Ontario Center um, with the help of Good Shepherd um, to do that for us. And uh, we started out um, pretty quickly with our 50. We're up to about um, 70 at the moment of uh, gentlemen that are staying there. Um, so we've been able to look at also how in the community can we also um, provide the level of support needed. We have families and women in the overflow in um, hotels throughout the community. So we have city staff and other partner staff um, that are uh, providing supports there as well. So we have really had to look at the kind of partnerships that we've got a real strong history of here in Hamilton. And uh, we've been really fortunate that to this point in time, we've been able to, to meet the demands and the requirements um, that we've been presented along the way. We know going forward that though that that's not gonna end um, even when we start to ease up and start to reopen some of these things. This sector is, a, is one of those where we know that we're gonna have to look at dedicating a lot of additional resources to as we go forward. Yeah, no doubt. It's, it's just the beginning in your world and you continue to do an excellent job. I'd also like to do a follow-up question here, Grace, in regards to, there have been a number of encampments or, or tent cities reported in the media over the last few weeks. Um, what is the city doing to support those individuals who are sleeping rough? 
Yeah, we've had a, a number of that of times have come up over the last uh, few weeks. I mean, it's nothing new um, generally. Mostly what we're looking at doing is uh, working with the strong partnerships, as I indicated, through with our street health outreach team, with the, um, the community health group, with police, our housing services. We've been trying to take a very individualized approach to um, ensuring what are the supports and services needed in order to help folks find the right accommodation. We're also looking at how we can fast track into some permanent housing. We, we're fortunate that we've got a number of hotel partners that we've been able to um, access some supports with. We've also then tried to determine about what kinds of supports do folks need in order to be successfully moved from the encampments. We know that it's not, that's not the, the best way for folks to, to live and to, um, to rest in that. And so that's why we're trying to move them as quickly as we can into a, a more sustainable approach to um, some shelter for them. But we've really been depending on the, our, the, the guidance of our street outreach team through public health to help us with that. And so far we've been able to have some good success, but we're continuing to monitor it all across the city to ensure that we're not, um, we're not starting any new encampments as, as we move along as well. Grace, just another quick final question before we move on to our second guest. Um, in regards to the, the homeless and the most vulnerable, how is their mindset and how are they getting some of the updates? They don't have access to televisions and internet like most of us do. Um, can you touch on those two brief questions for us, please? So it's a lot of it, again, is through the system that we've got set up through our street outreach, through those folks that um, are out on the street every day helping. Um, the HamSmart group, um, those are people that have a lot of connections out into the community. We're utilizing um, police and anyone that has that kind of daily contact that are out in the community and through our shelter system as well. Because we know that, you know, the we have lots of communication mechanisms available, but unfortunately, that's not the way folks are getting it. And it's really by word of mouth as well. So we're trying to tap into whatever those avenues are that we've got available to make sure that the message is getting out. Well, thank you very much for that and all the work you and your fine folks are doing. Uh, we have another guest joining us this evening on our virtual town hall. It's uh, Brother Ricker, Chief Executive Officer of the Good Shepherd, and he is uh, joining us as we continue our focus on Hamilton's most vulnerable population. Uh, Brother Richard, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And perhaps, and perhaps you could you talk to us a bit about the shelter, shelter system in Hamilton right now and what kinds of things uh, are, we so are we doing to support our vulnerable, vulnerable populations, populations and what are we doing to protect the health and safety health of and residents safety staying, of staying in shelter, shelter systems? systems? Well, across our community, we have a number of shelters that are operated by a variety of social service agencies like the Good Shepherd. It, the Good Shepherd itself is running just for men, for youth, for families, for women and children who are victims of violence and for single women. And then on top of that, uh, we stepped up to the plate and opened the first Ontario Centre in conjunction with our, the city and our community partners and um, have just recently taken over providing the responsibilities and overseeing the, uh, one of the hotels for single women in our community. Um, Part of the reason we've been able to do that is because of the cooperation with the city and it, its commitment to trying to find solutions when it's a very difficult and challenging time and a lot of moving pieces. We have struggled uh, to make sure that we keep people safe. And I think by and large in the shelter community, we have been able to uh, keep the virus out of the, out of the population and for the most part. We've done that in conjunction with Dr. Tim O'Shea in St. Joseph's Hospital by um, making sure that we're testing people in the shelter system every week. Not only the, the clients of the system, also the staff who work within that system each and every day. And we're, we're, we've done a good job. We've, we've turned around and been able to keep the virus out of the shelters. Certainly, that's not the same, the same story that we've got in other parts of our community, but we have done great things. And that first Ontario Centre allowed us to create more space with social distancing to allow people to live there. And as Grace mentioned here, there are 75 men that are, are there and we have additional beds if we needed them to accommodate people to make sure that there's a distance between the beds and on top of it to 
give people their own just so that they're not in each other's faces um, that we experience in our regular shelter system day in and day out. Well, to follow up on that regarding First Ontario Centre, of course, we all know it uh, to go and, and watch the Bulldogs play or to watch concerts. But can you talk to us a little bit more about those living arrangements and the temporary shelter and how the residents are holding up and how they are dealing with things on a daily basis down at First Ontario? Sure. Uh, we, we've created uh, dining room services on the on the skating rink itself or the, the, the basketball court or whatever it's used for. That's where the dining room is. And it's adjacent to that, which would have been underneath most of the bleachers, is, is the area for dorms or, or places for people to sleep. Then on top of it, there are recreational areas and then shower and washroom facilities adjacent to that. We also, Good Shepherd has offer, also offered a... Um, uh, clinic there where you have our nurse practitioners going in and making sure that people are healthy and receiving any medical treatment. We have also worked with the Hamilton AIDS Network and, and, try, and the, and the uh, city in terms of making sure that uh, injection sites or safe material is available for people so that we're not, in fact, uh, asking people to, who might have an addiction to go back out onto the streets to um, to shoot up or whatever, we've got to be able to figure out a way to make that safe. And we, we've done that thus, thus far. And I, I think uh, kudos to staff who've been able to manage that situation as it is each and every day. In that space, we've also provided recreation facilities and TV and things like that. But still, people are, in fact, uh, coming and going um, with uh, some uh, ass assessments when they come in in terms of being reassessed for any of the virus symptoms. For those that are working in First Ontario and for those that are using that as shelter right now, uh, brother, um, similar to my question earlier, what is, what's the morale like down there? What are their feelings uh, as we go through this pandemic? Well, I just want to say our, the, the generally the morale of Good Shepherd and in in the, my co-workers has been very positive when we've been trying to make sure that we have committed to them to one, keep them safe, to keep them informed about the virus, and we do that as an agency by sending out three um, weekly newsletters to them. We provide everybody with personal uh, protection wear. We've we instituted the wearing of masks for both clients and uh, our staff within the facilities and making sure that people are hand washing. Uh, on, top, on top of that, I said, uh, we, we, in ter terms of keeping people safe, we've been testing people. So that's been a, a real important uh, uh, alleviator of fear for our staff and for the clients themselves so that they know that they're coming to a place that's safe for them and we know that we're creating an environment for staff that's safe and we've done that throughout all our shelters whether it's our women or single women uh, in our family shelter we, we, we try to make sure that people have the information that they need and they can in fact uh, remain safe um, while delivering their work which is so important at this time. By all means, thank you very much for that update, brother. Richard, truly do appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, we're gonna hop back over to you now. Would you mind highlighting some of the supports or initiatives for our vulnerable popula uh, populations from the other levels of government, if you wouldn't mind? Thank you, Mike. And uh, so certainly compliments to uh, brother Richard and Grace and uh, all the folks that have been working to uh, look after our most vulnerable citizens uh, in the community during this pandemic. And, you know, obviously clearly these kinds of challenges amplifies some of the uh, social challenges we have and uh, hopefully when we come out of this that uh, we'll find a better way of looking after these folks uh, going forward and to that end the federal government announced 157 million dollar uh, funding envelope for uh, across Canada for Canadians experiencing homelessness so that's a top up of money that will certainly assist be able to provide the kind of shelter space and housing space that's going to be required $50 million to go to women's shelter and sexual assault centers, including facilities in the Indigenous communities as well. So their uh, capacity and their need to uh, prevent an outbreak is, uh, is also uh, very important. So those funds are going to go towards that effort. $7.5 million in funding to Kids Help Phone Line. And as you know, we, uh, we mentioned Kids Help Phone Line and mental health phone lines on this uh, broadcast pretty regularly. And uh, this is an organization that also needs to have assistance to be able to help people with mental health supports during this difficult time. So they're gonna get a $7.5 million infusion to help them do that very important work. And again, mental health is amplified during this uh, crisis time. Uh, many people that are 
maybe mildly suffering uh, with mental health issues might, uh, you know, have, have some more challenges as a result of this kind of very nervous and anxious times that we're living through. So we encourage people to reach out and get the help they need. And lastly, uh, the uh, $9 million through, through to the United Way Canada for local organizations to support practical services for Canadians and seniors. And so to that end, the federal government also announced a, a one-time top-up of up to $500 for seniors, uh, depending on whether or not you're in guaranteed income supplements or whether you're uh, taking old age pension that variably, there's either a $300 or $500 amount that can come to you uh, this month. Uh, they'll spend an extra $20 million on expanding the New Horizons for Seniors program as well that supports community-based pro projects for seniors. And again, many seniors in our community are challenged. Uh, you know, some of them are single and alone and, uh, you know, lonely, uh, having financial challenges potentially. And so there, there are some assists that are going to be required to help our seniors get through this uh, challenge as well. All of these uh, programs and financial supports, again, you can find on the city's COVID-19 webpage. Uh, there is uh, there's an updating on that page each and every day. Or if you uh, can't don't have a computer and can't get on that page, you can do it over the phone. So you can contact City of Hamilton COVID-19 hotline at 905-974-9848. Uh, there are operators on the other end of that line that can direct you to all of the programs uh, that have been announced to date and how you get access to the, that level of assistance uh, for individuals, businesses, or, or, or otherwise. So do take advantage of that hotline if you uh, need to do it by phone. And again, the uh, website uh, on the city's, uh, city's page, City COVID-19 webpage, you'll find all of these programs identified and ways and means by which you can get access to them. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that update, Mr. Mayor. We're going to head over uh, back again to Dr. Richardson. And doctor, can you please provide an update on the false positives that were identified? And if that is something that could happen again? Sure, Mike, absolutely. So, you know, people have heard a fair bit about this already, about the um, false positives that were reported to us by the lab at the end of last week. Uh, the deputy director for the Public Health Ontario Lab called us to let us know that they had just seen, um, they do ongoing quality assurance. And as they've been looking at the results coming off that day, they'd seen that a number of people had tested positive that were asymptomatic. And of course, we know we had been doing this mass testing in long-term care homes. So, you know, most of the tests we were doing were on people who didn't have any symptoms. And although they would see a run of positives in the symptomatic group, it was unusual for them to see this in the asymptomatic group. So they gave us a call just to give us a heads up and said, you know, we know we've reported these to you, but as we're looking at them, we're going to send them on to have them retested at the Toronto lab which they did. And then once they had done that in the morning, they said, well, we want to run it one more set of tests again. And so they did do that and uh, followed up with this with final results by uh, end of the day on, on um, the following day on the Friday. Um, so overall with that, there were 10 confirmed staff cases at McCastle Lodge that had been involved that, in that initial batch. Um, those ones all did turn out to be negative as well there were eight false positives. So whenever they see an issue, they, they start to look to see how extensive it might be. And so they went through a lot more tests. And remembering that, that over the course of the last 10 days, we've done about 8,000 tests in long-term care facilities alone. Um, so they found about eight more tests that were uh, they, they thought might have been a part of the same issue. They retested them and let us know that those were also false positives. So overall, there were the 10 at McCastle Lodge, three at Heritage Green, three at Wentworth Lodge, one at St. Elizabeth's Villa, and one from first place. So ultimately, we'd been in the process of declaring an outbreak at Macassa. We had declared one at Heritage Green and at Wentworth based on the results we'd had. And those uh, ended up being undeclared um, uh, as a result of, of understanding that these were false positives. So absolutely a stressful time for the individuals that were affected and the facilities that were affected. And you know, when we're in a period of fear and uncertainty, you know, that kind of stress is, is absolutely heightened. And so, you know, for sure, there were people who were quite relieved to find out that they were not positive, they were negative, and there were facilities who were thrilled to find out that indeed they didn't have an outbreak and they didn't need to add the additional measures on. It was, of course, very stressful and difficult for the families and uh, all of the people that were involved and so very unfortunate. 
In terms of going forward, I mean, the really great news is our lab colleagues are all the time on it doing quality assurance processes and looking to see if there's any discrepancy with the result. And as I said, out of the, the thousands and thousands of tests that were being done, those were there were 18 results that they questioned. And uh, they will continue to go on and look at tests and see if there are any and, and let us know of them. So we sincerely hope it won't happen again. We have every faith in the Public Health Ontario lab. And um, you know their quality assurance processes just reassure us that they're trying to do their very best job all of the time. So they'll continue to investigate. They'll continue with their their uh, processes and let us know if there are any. But uh, we don't expect to see anything soon. Oh, that's great news. Thank you very much for that update, uh, Doctor. Um, Paul, we're getting some more questions coming in. I know you've kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier in regards to reopening Hamilton and Ontario. And it sounds like tomorrow the Premier is set to make some announcements. You mentioned that as well. In regards to Hamilton specific, what are we doing to prepare to reopen and what can residents expect over the coming weeks? Well, thanks. And, and this is a huge piece of work that we're doing right now because we do anticipate uh, things will start to continue to progress towards reopening. It's not going to be fast. It's not going to be a day this and then the next day that, but we have to get prepared for it. Um, before I talk a little bit about some of the specifics we're looking at, I, I do want to uh, commend, uh, you know, the last few weeks we've had uh, some of my colleagues from the Emergency Operations Centre on tonight. Grace has been here and it's really helpful for people to hear from directly the people that are actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh, throughout this crisis. And if you think about uh, the job of closing up the city and now trying to figure out how we work through all the things that are happening during this uh, period of, of isolation, and then also looking at how we start to restart services, uh, the operations chief job is uh, incredibly difficult. I know Grace would say you got a great team and all the rest, but it does take somebody to make sure that all that information is flowing correctly. So it's fantastic. And then to have partners, you know, a lot of the work that we do as the city of Hamilton is delivered by community partners. You think about childcare, although we do have one uh, city run childcare facility, the vast majority of our childcare spaces are delivered by community partners. And you just heard from brother Richard in terms of homelessness. And you know, what's really good in Hamilton is that uh, we know each other well, we work together. The fact that I can text and call brother Richard on a cell phone and say, hey, how can we get some things happening to really work well to support those who are vulnerable uh, makes a difference in this community. So I wanna start there because some of what what we're looking at is, of course, how will programs like our homeless shelters in the city of Hamilton uh, be different through this period of time? Reopening is not just about opening up a center that was closed or turning a program back to the way it was. Uh, because uh, as the mayor has said, and, and Dr. Richardson reminds us regularly, the virus is not going to disappear when we enter into stage one or stage two or stage three of reopening. Until we have a full-on immunity strategy, whether that's a vaccine or something else, uh, we're going to have to protect ourselves uh, from this vaccine. And so how we deliver shelter, how we deliver childcare uh, will be different. And quite literally, we're having to go through every single program that we offer and deliver as the city of Hamilton, but also those programs that we support, uh, coordinate and fund that are, are some of the uh, critical uh, services that the community has. And even in recreation, everybody says, well, you know, thinking about our recreation centers. Well, don't forget most of the people who use our recreation facilities facilities indoor and outdoor are community groups and you know hockey associations and baseball associations and all of those folks that want to rent space deliver programs within our space run their leagues within our space are all worried about this I can tell you that some of the reopening will be uh, done for us uh, by the by the province so things like uh, we run a couple of golf courses obviously uh, uh, three 18 holes in, in uh, one at two at Shadok and then obviously Kings Forest when those open we'll be looking to open uh, dog parks will become open by uh, you know the release of the print provincial order at some point so our we will open our, our leash free dog park so some of that will be fairly straightforward when the province releases us from those provincial orders we'll be able to start some of those programs the others become much more challenging and the piece of work that we've uh, really just about wrapped up today is what are some of those infection prevention and control you know i have an iphone and an ipod but i'm realizing that ipac is the new thing that i have to think about all the time infection prevention and control and um, elizabeth i've listened a lot to that <laughs> but um you know all joking aside it is the fundamental thing we need to get right 
before we start to bring uh, those services back online. That's what will protect our staff. That's what will protect the pu public as they utilize our services. So we've spent a lot of time uh, with our HR department, through our occupational health folks, our health safety and wellness team, uh, with public health to get that right. Because from that foundation, whether we're talking about an office space, whether we're talking about an outdoor facility, uh, whether we're talking about uh, city hall and the council chambers, uh, we have to get that right so that we can protect folks. So now that we have that in place, uh, we're going to be starting to look at how that that factors into the way we'll deliver service. The last thing I'll say is, uh, is sort of where I began that com con this conversation, which which is I think uh, folks in Hamilton, whether you live here, do business here or study here, you're going to have to realize that services are not going to come back uh, anytime soon to exactly the same way they were delivered in February. There are going to be some changes, which I think will stick for a considerable period of time. And uh, we're working through that now. And as I say, we're on a clock of uh, within about two weeks, uh, we're going to be able to have that uh, full on conversation with the community about what they can expect uh, as we get advice from the province and the federal government and our own local health officials to begin to reopen more services here. Yes, it definitely is a uh, time to readjust and, and rewire ourselves. And part of that IPAC, Paul, should also be packing your patients as well. There's going to be a lot of that required as we continue to move on. Thank you for that. Grace uh, Mater, back to you now. Hamilton, like many cities, uh, was experiencing an, affor an affordable housing crisis long before COVID-19 hit. Um, what measures is the city taking to help people find safe housing? Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, you're right. So I think all COVID-19 did for the housing crisis was just put a, uh, a big spotlight on it. Um, and for us, um, we've been trying to um, look at what are the measures that we need to ensure that we're looking at to um, safely and permanently house people, because ultimately that's the best goal and the best uh, end result for them. And we're trying to do that through increasing the kind of outreach that we've, uh, like I mentioned before, for, and how do we um, find out from people as to what it is, what is the best route to housing for them? And everybody has a different route to get there. Um, and so we want to take a very individualized approach to it in order to get them not only housed, but more successfully. Um, but we know that in Hamilton that we had a shortage. Um, we've reached out to the private housing market to find out you know, what is available. And in some regards, through the COVID crisis, we've been able to tap into some of the, the um, broader community to get messages out. And so we've had a lot of private comp um, housing groups reach out to us as well um, to talk about opportunities in that. And so we're trying to use this as a bit of an opportunity to, um, to find out how, you know, what is available and how can we best tap into it. Um, but we do know that it's not going to be easy either, um, as you know, we've, as we've been talking about that this is going to be an ongoing um, issue for us. We are looking at what are, you know, fast tracking where we can, some of those permanent housing options, having more units come on board. We've been able to, you know, over the last number of months before this, we had investments going into renovations for units that had been empty. So we're looking at, you know, utilizing those opportunities as well. But we know that we're, we can't do it alone. And so we're um, looking at that if anyone is interested and has anything available to reach out through um, our website, through um, housing at hamilton.ca. Um, and uh, we're hoping that, you know, we'll, we'll be continue to work together with our partnerships um, along the way to get for the most successful outcome for folks. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that update. Uh, Brother Richard, we're going to swing back over to you now. Uh, in regards to spotlights being shone on things, uh, there is the, the, the support that women, children uh, need and victims of abuse. Can you please talk to us about the services and supports that are available to these people? There are four domestic violence. There are four domestic violence shelters here in the community. The last one being one that the Good Shepherd operates at Martha House, which is on per, on Pearl Street, um, where we have 40 beds for women and children who are victims of violence, and an additional 25 beds for single women. And one of the challenges has been the the issue of um, the women who are trapped in their homes at this time. Often they're trapped with their partners. They live in violent situations. They, they're under a greater spotlight or a, a greater um, 
eye of their partners and and are have been struggling to reach out. We've we've reached out to us by phone. They've reached out to us by uh, emails, and and just trying to figure out ways that we can help that woman weather the crisis and and encourage her to leave if that's what needs to do. I mean, the challenges are, does she stay where she is and know that she at least is safe from the COVID virus, but at the same time, she finds herself um, not necessarily safe from her partner. I think the other part of it is, is that we, we know that we've also seen a number of overflow beds being in some of the hotels. And the difficulty with that is that we don't always have those necessary supports or safety measures in place that we that exist within domestic violence shelters. We've done a lot of stuff in terms of online counseling with women on in ways in which we can reach out to them and and if necessary they can come in and then we will find that place for them. So it's it's a real uh, a challenge we're facing each and every day not only with women but also some of the vulnerable youth of our community who who find themselves being victimized on our streets. Yes, and yes, they, uh, they uh, are, definitely are definitely all in our thoughts. thoughts. Thank you very much for that update, Brother Richard. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we're going to head back over to you now. Uh, is this considering changing some high pedestrian traffic areas uh, to pedestrians only to help with physical distancing? Uh, thank you, Mike. You know, this has been a question I think we've tried to address a number of times. And, uh, you know, the reality is that uh, our emergency operations center does not believe that we have a particular challenge anywhere in the city of Hamilton in terms of people being uh, able to physically distance and still get outside and enjoy the things that they want to do. We have multiple cycle lanes in our community, uh, many sidewalks. Uh, the, certainly the sidewalks and road spaces today are wide open. The parks are open now and have been open you know, all the way through in terms of people getting access to that. So th th what we didn't want to do is open up a street and make that an attractor to have people come together to bike, ride, rollerblade, uh, skateboard, and do all the things they might like to do in one location. So the decision was not to open up uh, any street for that kind of activity. Having said that, the city is constantly working on, through regular city council activity, introducing bike lanes. Uh, there's a new bike lane coming in at uh, on Lock Street with uh, some physical separation uh, built into that. We have the Cannon Street bike lane. We have a number of uh, cycle lanes throughout the city. I can tell you uh, that it's a, it's a process of wanting to develop complete streets throughout our city. Maybe not fast enough for some, but we, we really didn't think it was appropriate to make those kinds of changes during the middle of a pandemic. Was There really wasn't a need to set, a, set aside any, any of that kind of uh, separate space to, for, for people to get activity into. Right now, all the trails are open. Uh, the waterfront trails are open, the bayfront trail is open, uh, the parks are open, the, uh, the Conservation Authority trails are open, so there's even more space now than there was before for people to get access to uh, open spaces if they want to run, jog, bike, ride, rollerblade, what, whatever they want to do, horseback ride on the trails in, uh, in, in the Dundas Valley. And so uh, it's even less of an issue today than it was, uh, was a number of weeks ago. And uh, going forward, any member of council, any uh, you know local ward issue, people can uh, can work with their councillors, and we can look at opportunities to uh, make uh, pedestrian friendly, more pedestrian friendly streets in various locations. It just needs a broader public debate around how that happens or whether or not it should. And uh, it really isn't an emergency operations center matter for them to deal with. So we've actually not have them make that decision and uh, any decisions going forward in terms of providing any additional space will be done through city council. Wonderful, thank you very much for that uh, update there, Mr. Mayor, it is appreciated. Dr. Richardson, back over to you now. A question has come in in regards to, uh, if you could please provide an update on the provincially directed mass testing in long-term care homes. Yeah, thanks, Mike. We're very happy to report that this testing is essentially complete at this point. So we're well ahead of schedule. The target was to have it all done by uh, this Friday. And uh, we knew we were ahead of the game as of last Friday when we surpassed the 50% target. Um, and so huge uh, thank you out to all the long-term care homes who have done all this testing, to uh, the people who assisted with it, like EMS, to our own public health staff who did all the coordination and 
uh, and are now dealing with all the results that have come back through for it. Um, so 97% of staff in all of our long-term care homes as of Monday were done, 97% of our residents are done. So there may be still one or two that come through, uh, but essentially we consider that to be complete. Um, uh, we also did the testing amongst our child care staff. So as you know, as Grace has talked about, we are providing essential child care to our uh, essential service workers. And 98% of our currently active child care staff, so those who are actually working and providing care, are tested at this point as well. So again, there might be one or two that, that end up coming back in to work um, and they'll get tested, but we're essentially complete. Wonderful, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we're just kind of looking at time here. We wanna to get to another question before we maybe have you wrap things up uh, with your final thoughts. With the state of emergency still active, this has decided to suspend the sale and display of fireworks. Of course, with big events like Victoria Day coming up this weekend and Canada Day just down the road, what was this decision uh, and how was it made? Well, thanks, Michael. And, uh, you know, they've left me to, uh, to you know, share some of the bad news uh, to the community today. First, the wave pool, now the fireworks issue. So, uh, again, uh, I have to, uh, to, uh, to let folks know that uh, by, by virtue of the request from the uh, fire chief, uh, they've uh, decided to ban the sale and discharge of fireworks this, uh, we this weekend through to July the 4th. So that would cover the Victoria Day weekend as well as the Canada Day weekend. And uh, unfortunately, uh, bringing uh, large groups together for fireworks displays is just not a good idea. Uh, for those that are firing off fireworks in the local neighborhoods, it generally kind of promotes people coming together to uh, watch that and watch that display. And of course, the, the kind of gatherings that we're trying to avoid and have been trying to avoid for quite some time now. So uh, why would we continue to promote that? So the decision was made to, first of all, stop the sale of the fireworks. So that would uh, prevent the promoting of these uh, shooting shooting off the fireworks uh, wherever in our city and then uh, to to ban the the actual firing of the fireworks and that goes into you know all all areas neighborhoods uh throughout the community uh it, it also requires quite frankly uh, if things go wrong a a first responders response and that will also continue to bring more people together so the whole idea is let's avoid it for this year let's save our fireworks uh, displays for another year but you can tune into the, the Rotary Club of Dundas, who's uh, you know annually on the Victoria Day weekend, uh, where the ones setting off the fireworks in the drive-through park uh, are doing a virtual fireworks display. So they will air that on uh, Cable 14 this Sunday, May the 17th, uh, which is the original date for the fireworks in the Dundas Driving Park. So you can uh, dial in there and still see a pretty dramatic fireworks display. And in your mind, side, you can pretend you're at the Dundas Driving Park fighting the traffic to get in and fighting the traffic to get out and uh, enjoying that uh, hour and a half uh, anticipation when the fireworks goes off. And so do that virtually by going to the uh, Cable 14 this Sunday, May the 17th, and you can still see a spectacular fireworks display. Okay, my PVR is set. Maybe I'll even watch it live. We'll see. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you to everyone at home for your questions tonight. Uh, and before we actually wrap up, Mr. Mayor, back to you. I wanted to give you a few extra minutes. Uh, do, you, do you have any final comments that you'd like to pass along to your constituents in this great city of Hamilton? Well, I I'd like to share some good news stories, actually, Mike, and uh, let me just Let's be hear brief it. about that. Uh, a couple of quick shout outs to the following organizations. Uh, the, the YMCA of Hamilton, Burlington, Brantford. Uh, the doors are closed at the Y, but you, due to the pandemic, but they can but that's not stopping the Y from helping people uh, stay physically fit. So they've gone to a virtual online exercise program for all ages and all fitness levels. So go to YW, uh, we, or yweareherece.ca for more information and how you can dial into the virtual workout uh, to help people uh, stay fit throughout this pandemic. So people are being innovative and creative in terms of delivering programs. Also a shout out to the Cancer Assistance Program, the uh, their pandemic uh, is not stopping their annual fundraising walk. So uh, normally it happens on Bayford Park this year. It's, a, it's a, uh, going to be a virtual walk. And so they're asking people to take part on May the 23rd by walking, running, or cycling five kilometers in their own neighborhood. Uh, participants can then post their involvement on social media and uh, set fundraising goal of some $35,000 and are hoping to get about 250 people to sign up. So a worthy organization, uh, cancerassist.ca is where you can go to get more information on that. 
and uh, and and thank them for uh, doing their ongoing programs. And just a, again, a, a thank you to uh, Rosalie Visors and Georgia Whalen, who uh, each and every time out uh, do our our sign language, American Sign Language interpretations. And uh, proud again, proud of our uh, the response in our community. Uh, we can't say it again. Frontline uh, workers are heroes. You know, I spent the better part of a day wearing a mask the other day. I can tell you, it's not the most comfortable thing to to be to be working in, and I, I can only imagine what it feels like if you're a frontline worker in the hospitals, having to do that day in and day out, long hours with masks and everything else and all the other equipment they have. Uh, they're doing yeoman's work, and we can't thank them enough. And then this week, it's Nurses Week, and so we uh, celebrate all the nurses out there that uh, are continue to do some, such great work to uh, help us through this pandemic and every day through regular healthcare issues. And I'll end with uh, the uh, a request for people to make sure they're also looking after not only the COVID uh, pandemic issues, but their regular health issues. Get a hold of your doctor if you're having health issues. Get a hold of the eMERGE if you need uh, assistance there or you need, need the paramedics, uh, the ambulance. Uh, do not ignore your health issues because you're worried about going to the hospital. Very important that you uh, stay healthy in every way possible from COVID as well as any other health issues you might have. It's very important. So I encourage you, implore you to ensure that you call your doctor if you're having challenges, call your paramedics or, your, or the ambulances, go to the eMERGE, don't be afraid to go. Uh, they're looking after all the health issues and there's no fear of going to the hospital and uh, developing COVID. It's very much a separated issue. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. Get the health care you need. Thanks, Mike. Those are my uh, last final comments. And again, thank you to our broader community for all the great work they're doing. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much uh, for the updates. And of course, uh, for those final words and a very special thank you to brother Richard McPhee and Grace Mater, our special guests this evening, who were able to answer questions about assisting Hamilton's uh, vulnerable populations during COVID-19 and the COVID-19 emergency. And of course, we want to remind uh, you that the city continues to accept donations of personal protective equi equipment, otherwise known as PPE, to provide much needed resources for the citywide response to COVID-19. And the equipment will be provided to frontline workers, as the mayor just alluded to, emergency responders, and other healthcare professionals. And the types of equipment that will be accepted, well, they include surgical masks and N95 masks, impervious gowns, gloves, face shields, and other eye protection, swabs, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and of course, powered uh, air purifying respirators. Of course, the city is requesting these items from local healthcare providers, pest control, hospitality providers, nail salons and construction companies. And please note, we say this every week, homemade equipment will not be accepted. However, if you do have equipment that can be accepted, we ask, uh, or to donate, I should say, we ask that you email ppe at hamilton.ca or call 905-546-2424, extension 2257 for more information. We'd like to thank our panelists, our American Sign Language interpreters, and of course our production team for making tonight's town hall possible. And we also like to thank you for watching and listening on Cable 14, 900 CHML radio, on the City of Hamilton's YouTube channel, and of course on our new toll-free number. Please, Hamilton, continue to monitor all of our local media outlets for the latest news and updates from the City of Hamilton regarding the COVID-19 outbreak. Enjoy your long weekend. We will be back next Wednesday for another virtual town hall. It all kicks off at 7 p.m. Hamilton, stay safe after yourselves and each other. I'm Mike Fortune. Good night.